Oh, I like the title foolproof in relation to Proverbs. I reckon you could even call it devil proof. And uh, how to devil proof your life, how to foolproof your life by practical wisdom that's gained from life experience. Um, you know, Proverbs is all about the gaining of wisdom. There's a big difference between knowledge, having the facts about a matter, and wisdom, which is applying those facts to my daily life. So it's not just theoretical information or learning that I can say, yeah, I've learned that. It's actually, that's knowledge. But wisdom is to apply that knowledge that's gained to my practical living, how I live with my family, how I live within my church, how I live within my community, how I interact at work with my neighbourhood, in sporting clubs, in, in every dimension of our life. We must learn how to live out what we know. And we gain a lot of knowledge when we come to Christ. Gain a lot of knowledge, wonderful knowledge. But gee whiz, we've got to live it out, live out what we know and apply it. And that, that's, that's wisdom. See, in the first nine chapters of Solomon, and I'll talk about the next chapters 10 to 20 next week as such. But in the first nine chapters, Solomon actually personifies wisdom and folly as two women. Now, some of the girls here might get a bit upset about this. Uh, he could have said two men, but he chose two women. And so uh, it's not personal, but he actually personifies what a wise person does and what a foolish person does by, by actually saying, okay, she is speaking and to learn from her, but it's not a particular person he's referring to. So chapters uh, two to four um, give us the reasons why wisdom is good for us. In chapters five and seven, why folly is bad for you. <laughs> so if you want to know what's foolish, read chapters uh, five to seven. Um, you know, Lady Folly, let's call her that, Lady Folly entices us to do the wrong thing. And chapter five is pretty devastating. In fact, men, women who are married here, don't even think about committing adultery. The consequences are horrendous. And you read it in, in Solomon, and that's just one of the areas that foolish people, it will burn you up. In fact, I reckon in part of our marriage preparation, for all the men particularly, we should get them to read those chapters and also show the film Fatal Attraction. <laughs> it's an adult only film. I think we should show that. That will scare the living daylights out of you. It's like, it ain't worth it. There are consequences to listening to Lady Folly. Um, but Lady Wisdom... She encourages us to do the right things. And, and in fact, she says to us, don't consider doing anything that God hates. And then in chapter 6, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to Him. Have a look at this. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Now, that's what God hates. It's detestable to Him. But what does He love? What does He really love? And what does He want to see in you and in me? You know, what Solomon warns against here and encourages us in fits in beautifully with what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. You read chapters 5, 6 and 7 of Matthew, you think, hey, Jesus, I think you've read Proverbs. <laughs> he did. And he quoted them, he, he referred to them. And then if you read Paul's letters, the second half of all of his letters is all practical wisdom. How to live, how to function, how to apply the knowledge you gain in your everyday life. In fact, Jesus' baby brother, James, he writes a, writes a whole book. And if you read the book of James and then you check out the Sermon on the Mount and link it in with Proverbs, you see there's a similarity. So the Proverbs 
had a profound influence upon Jesus, Paul, James, all the writers of the New Testament. So what does the Lord really love to see in you as one of his redeemed children? Well, the opposite of what it says, the six things he hates. You know what he wants to see in you? He wants to see that you've got humble eyes. Humble eyes. Eyes that see all people as beings that are created in the image of our loving Heavenly Father, who loves and adores His special creation, human beings, and for whom Jesus, His Son, died on a cross to save. Folks, all human beings, not just those of us here, but outside the, the four walls of this, of this place, all human beings are loved and adored by God, and they have value they have worth and they have dignity, absolute dignity. And a person with humble eyes, in contrast to haughty eyes, will see people as Jesus sees them. That's why I'm really so thankful for the, the, the Me Too movement that, that arose in a couple of years ago. Now, I know there's some extremes in the application of it and false allegations and stuff like that. But when you read the stories of, of men in power, from a Harvey Weinstein to a Bill Cosby, I mean, you know, icons in Americana. And now even the ex-leader of the opposition in New South Wales, that they would just abuse women, that they're in power, and whether they're drunk or on drugs or whatever, that they would do those despicable things. I, I'm just dumbfounded. You know, I'm thinking, as a dad of three beautiful girls, man, I'd half crown those guys if I wasn't a Christian. And that poor ABC reporter, oh, two years, and she says, I didn't want it to go public because I know it's going to end up a court case and I don't want my family to go through it. And the young man that was with her who saw the whole thing take place, part of me says, mate, why don't you just go up to him, even if he's the leader, and give him a slap across the face. In front of everyone say cut it out stop that and, and shame him for what he did to that young girl he didn't do it i wish they'd do it straight away like get into him you know like i'm not into violence but i think it's called justice <laughs> greek justice anyway you know what i mean like i just think man if you've got humble eyes you will respect everyone and you don't view women as playthings or sex objects and women don't view men in that way and I just think even though there's extremes that have happened in the Me Too movement I think it's a good thing I think it's a God thing to say hey come on girls don't put up with rubbish the CRC uh, as a denomination back in the late 80s early 90s we put together a sexual harassment policy really clear light years ahead before society and we basically said to all our ministers you become an ordained CRC minister or an elder, or a leader in the church, you do this and you're out. That's it. No compromise. So we said that. We said that. And we've actually implemented it. If a man crosses the line, he's out. He can no longer be an ordained CRC minister. He's vowed before God, he's vowed to obey and to follow the law of the land and the processes of our CRC movement. So we did that jolly 25 years ago. The world's just catching up. Honest tongues, <laughs> in contrast to lying tongues. Honest tongues. You know, to, as believers in Christ, we are to always say what we mean and mean what we say and not have duplicity and not speak with forked tongues. <laughs> and, uh, and if you always tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. It's true. Because if you, if you tell lies... What did I say to Philip? Mm, that's probably different to what I said to Cass and then to Michael. And you've got to remember everything. You'll get trapped. It's the devil's turf. He's the father of lies. And so we're to be truth tellers. So you don't, have to, you don't have to remember everything. You just make sure you tell the truth. And if you exaggerate, you, hold, you say, well, you know, hey, Philip, I think what I said there was not quite, a little bit of exaggeration. Let me go back. Or if somehow you inadvertently said something that was just 
not quite legit. The, the, the spirit of Christ within us says, you know what, I've got to correct that. To be honest talkers, <laughs> what we say, hear me on this, what we say shows our attitude towards others. How we talk reveals what we are really like. There's no such thing as, oh, I didn't mean to say that. When people say it to me, I didn't mean to say, well, actually, you did. You said it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Something dark in your heart has caused you to say that. Now, face up to it, repent of it. So how many times have I have, <laughs> have said something, talking to my wife, and I go, as the words are coming out, I, go, I want to catch them, bring them back. Sweetheart, I didn't mean that. She says, yes, you did. I'm sorry, that was dark, I shouldn't have said it, I shouldn't have thought it, I shouldn't have meditated on it, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our speech is a test of how wise we have become. Have we allowed Jesus through the Holy Spirit to, to keep circumcising our hearts, to make sure it doesn't get hardened and, and we allow the presence of Christ who died on a cross for us, rose again from the dead, went back to heaven, sent the precious Holy Spirit to live within us, to help us in this, because we can't do this on our own, folks. This is not law, this is grace. Humble eyes, honest tongues, helping hands. Not hands that shed innocent blood or that are violent. In Christ's name, we are to show mercy whenever it is needed. Why? Because he has been so merciful to us. And we now are to treat people just like we would want to be treated. That's Jesus' golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. Imagine if every single person on planet Earth just took that maxim. Treat others as you want to be treated. The world would be revolutionized, be transformed. Let's think about it. Treat others as you want to be treated. How do you want to be treated? Well, that's how you should treat others. And so this is to, to be people whose hands are dedicated to showing mercy and to giving mercy, not rushing to judgment, but uh, leaning on mercy. Having holy hearts, not hearts that devise wicked schemes. We can have holy hearts because we're now indwelt by the Holy Spirit and He produces His nature and character in us. You can't live like this unless you're a Christian. You can't, you've got to be born again. You need the Spirit of God to come within you. And, and His power and His life enables us that our hearts will change. And His Holy Spirit continually renews our inner life and empowers us to live as Jesus expects us to live, according to the Sermon on the Mount. Because you can't live by the Sermon on the Mount. It's impossible. Unless you have Jesus' life being lived out through you as you depend upon Him, because you can't change your own heart, only He can. Holy hearts. And to be grace givers, because Jesus now lives in us, by His Holy Spirit, we will naturally want to reflect and, ex and express His nature. And that is that we are grace givers, and we're also truth tellers. Put the other one up if you like, guys, too. Yeah, put them both together. Grace givers and truth tellers. And so, I love this scripture in John chapter 1. Have a read of this. The Word became flesh, that's Jesus, and made His dwelling among us. Oh, we've seen His glory. The glory of the one and only, the Father, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Wow. Wow. If he's full of grace and truth, and if he lives in you, then grace and truth will be operative in your life. It has to be. John 1, 16, from the fullness of his grace, Jesus' grace, we have all received one blessing after another. Man, we are blessed. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In Greece, I had... Oh, several experiences amazing what can happen in a week and uh they there was a pastor at the refresh conference and i was asked 
to sit down and try and consult with them, talk with them, counsel them, whatever. And, um, and I tell you, it, it wasn't a pretty picture. Must have had two and a half hours with him, prayed with him at the end, but his wife won't live with him. His kids hardly would talk with him. His ministry is being affected. And, uh, but but all, all that I heard from him is excusing himself and accusing everyone else. I just listen. And I'm thinking, man, you're losing everything. How can you be so deceived? I'm thinking, let me say it to him. How can you be so deceived? Your wife won't talk to you. Your, your four children won't talk to you. People are not following you. Your financial support's drying up. You're going to lose your house. It was almost like, so I actually said to him, I said, you know, I said, look, I, I, you know, I don't want to be harsh on you. I said, but what is it in you that is sabotaging your own happiness? I said, are you programmed to sabotage your own happiness? What's happened to you that you can't see that you have any obligation in relation to, you're always accused, you've accused everyone else, except you excused yourself. And I said, you end up going to be a lonely old man. I said, I've got to tell you the truth. So to be a truth teller, you've got to speak the truth. But I tell you what, you've got to do it with grace. You can't, you can't just use truth as a battering ram. So I was able to spend a couple of hours with him and I even gave him my email address. I said, listen, write to me. I said, I want to help you. I said, I said I'm saddened that you're destroying your own life. There are a few tears and let me pray for him. And, and um, he doesn't belong to a... He's not part of a denomination that can bring correction. He's trying to continue his ministry and, and all this stuff is happening. I said, I said you can't. I said, I said you, you can't do it. I said, you've got to resolve these matters. <laughs> I said, you're not going to have people believing in you. So, you know, I had to speak the truth to him, but I tell you... Um, I've gone the extra mile. I said, okay, I'll give you my email address. Let's correspond. Like, I've got enough problems myself to handle in Australia. Do I need to handle Greece's problems too? <laughs> see, see, the truth telling, oh, I'll just tell him the truth and that's it. I'll just back off. But how can you tell the truth without also saying, I'm available if you need a sounding board to actually help you and, um, and to give him advice because he's in a bad way. You know, he really... Uh, so, you know, you, you, you've got to... If Jesus is in us, we, we must tell the truth and be truth tellers, but must be grace givers just, and treat others as we want to be treated. And again, if I was in his position, how would I want to be treated? That's how I'm treating him. How I want to be treated. My poor taxi driver on the final day. Oh, this is a terrible story. I've got to be at the airport at 7.30. So I put the alarm for 6.30 didn't work so the guy turns up at seven i said and i said the night before make sure the taxi driver is there at seven i've got to be there by 7 30. well 7 30 i come running out and the taxi driver's walking up and, and i'll tell you what if looks could have killed and the vibe knock you over he had it big time he was very anointed with anger <laughs> and and frustration and I think, oh boy, you know, so I'm, I'm, in, <laughs> I'm in difficulty now. So I go up to him and I say, my alarm didn't go off. I told him the truth. My alarm didn't go off. Well, he kind of thought maybe I'm making it up. So he just says to me, well, he goes, I said, I said I'm thankful you're here. I've got to get there quick. I said, but don't speed. I want to get there in one piece. I said, and, and he goes, well, he goes, I've, I've just lost another customer. He goes, I, I could have... Like, you know, like, this is early morning. This is where we get our, make our money, you know. So I'm thinking, okay. So I tell him the truth, that my alarm went off. But I said, listen, don't worry. I said, I will cover the lost payment. Well, he looked at me like, you know, Greeks don't do things like that. I said, I'll, I said whatever it's going to cost me, I'll double it. He looked at me like, then all of a sudden there's a smile on his face. And the vibe dissipated. And we sat down. So it cost me 35 uh, euro. I gave him 70. He couldn't believe it. So in the car, he's happy. I would be too if I was him. <laughs> and he says, what are you, and he says, what are you here for? I said, I'm here for conference. I just say, conference, you know, like. And he goes, and, and, and what's your subject? I said, theology. Oh, 
He said, so what do you do? I said, I'm a priest. You've got to use the pastor. No. Priest? He goes, but you don't look like a priest. Where's your black? I said, well, Protestant priests don't wear black. And I said, we also marry and have kids. We're different. I just threw those little things in there. Well, for 15 minutes, I'm witnessing to him. I presented Jesus to him. And at the end, he's thanking me. And, and, and really, like, what was a situation where I could have just been the truth teller and said, and let my money stay in my pocket. <laughs> but you see, grace giving says you've got to consider the effect on another person. And I didn't realize that it was going to open the door. But see, this is practical, practical living. You've got to... I could, have, I could have acted in an arrogant, haughty manner. I'm not going to see him again. Why should I give him another 35 bucks? But the Spirit of Christ in us convicts us of those things. And that was the final session as I'm leaving. When I arrived, something worse happened. <sighs> I mean, this is like your worst nightmare. So I arrive and I'm exhausted, jet lag. So we plan it. So the first 24 hours, I'm in the, I'm bed just watching CNN, watching a bit of snooker, all oh, wonderful games I saw. <laughs> and I'm, I, I just basically stripped off, ready to go in the bath, and I'm just, just lying down, and, and I hear this door, my door opening. <laughs> like, surreptitiously, and I'm thinking, who's there? Uh, fruit, fruit, in Greek, fruit, fruit. I said, what fruit? I've got a bowl of fruit for you. And I said, hold it. And before I knew it, she opened the door. <laughs> Mamma mia, I quickly covered myself. And I said, go out. <laughs> I mean, I was shocked. I was in shock. She would have been in more shock if she saw me. But anyway, so I, I you know, I'm jet lagged. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm not happy about this. I mean, I've been to hotels all over the world. And I even had a do not disturb sign. I'm thinking, do they not understand Greek? They're Greeks. So I rang the manager. I want to speak to the manager. I said to the receptionist. I told him, I said, well, I've just been broken into. <laughs> and he knew I wasn't happy. I said, I said, uh, I said, this person opened the door and I was not properly dressed. <laughs> and he's kind of like embarrassed, you know, like, oh, yes, yes, well, I will attend to it. Well, the next morning I'm having breakfast and this young woman comes up to me with tears in her eyes. And, and I mean, did she apologize? Like she's, it was me. I'm sorry. I think I'm going to get the sack over this. I'm new. And I'm thinking, by the time she finished, I felt like an absolute persecutor, <laughs> troublemaker. I dobbed on her to the manager. He must have done something to her because she was really upset. She's, she's thinking, like, I'm going to lose my job. So, so I'm thinking, oh, great. You know, like, this is the peacemakers, the final one. Okay, so here I am, I arrived, and I'm causing trouble to the management and the staff. Now, I was right to feel a little bit, up, but I, I was so right, but I was still so wrong, because I was a bit cross. So then I see her in the bar, you know, and after, and I'll go up to her, and I said to her, listen, I said, you have really repented well. In Greek, so I said, Medjana says, Polikala. I said, I'm sick, normally we want a yaki agri. I said, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit upset, but it was, you know, like, I said, but you, I said, you're not going to do this again. I said, never, never. Then I just said, give me your hand. I just, without the other thing, I just put 10 euros in her hand. I said, here, because you're a good girl and you've really learned a lesson. And I said, and I went a bit too far. And I gave it to her. Then I rang up the manager. I said, the manager. I said, listen, that girl is fantastic. I said, she's terrific. I said, she really has apologized so well. She's a really good worker. And I'm trying to pour it in, you see, to say. And every time I walked into the kitchen, you should have seen, into the, should have seen her beaming. I don't think she was wanting more money. I just think she was very appreciative. I think there was peace in that hotel. So, you know, just by, you can cause trouble. By being so right on an issue but so wrong with your attitude. I was so right. It was right. She shouldn't have done it, but I was so wrong because I was really cross and I, and I made life difficult for her and her boss and I could have done it better. So what do you do? You've got to put it right. 
even these little things, I, my conscience won't allow me to just ignore that. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you want to treat people as you want to be treated. For some reason, she wasn't trained properly. She's new. So I, I didn't say it to the managers. I just, I, they should know how to. So, folks, what am I saying here? These six things the Lord hates, they're detestable to Him, but what He loves, and through Christ, you can do the opposite, have humble eyes, honest tongues, helping hands, holy hearts, being grace givers, truth tellers, and peace makers. This is the normal Christian life. Solomon, he strikes gold here, and when he compares... Lady Folly with Lady Wisdom in those first nine chapters, it's, it's a terrific contrast. So if you want to cease being foolish in some ways, meditate on Proverbs. If you want not just knowledge, but to, a knowledge that's applied, follow Lady Wisdom. It's all there for you. Jesus referred to it. James referred to it. Paul and all his letters. And this is why we are not to be foolish people we're to be wise people and to allow Jesus Christ's wisdom and love and grace and truth and honesty and integrity to flow through us let's stand together yeah musos you come as well thank you Lord thank you Jesus for your goodness I'm sure as I've been sharing with you that you can think of situations even over the past week because I didn't want this to be theoretical wisdom is applying knowledge to our daily lives and uh, and these things happened to me in Greece um, unusual coming going you know like but it happens to us in in life I'm on the plane coming home and this older Greek woman comes up to me and she goes I'm really scared I can't speak English can you help me I said oh yeah okay well it took me normally I just go through Adelaide just put my thing through you know I'm out in about five minutes 45 minutes later <laughs> she, she hasn't filled in her card properly and I'm trying to vouch for her I don't know her and I said to the guy, I said, I, said, I said, give her a break. I said, she doesn't know what the address is. She's just put the telephone number of her brother-in-law. I said, she's fine. She's Greek. Like that. And they just look at me. All right. <laughs> All right. I don't know. So I just, but having to help her all the way through. But sometimes there are things that are, that are inconvenient. They're interruptions. They're, it's, I was wanting to see my wife and my kids and my grandkids. It was a bit longer. So sometimes they're, they're, these things are there and uh, for us to be Christ in that situation, to be different to others. And while I'm in the line there, there's these poor kids are screaming their heads off. And, uh, and of course, they, the, 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 the border guys, you know, they, I said, I went, I said, I said I said, you see those babies that are crying? I said, these people have been on the plane. I said, just, can you get them to come through? So I'm taking charge of the border police. I'm saying, can you just, and he goes, oh, but I said, just lift the thing up. Let them, let them through, will you? Look at them. The kids, kids destroy. Oh, all right. Duh, like. <laughs> so, you've got to see what others can't see. You know, children that are beside themselves after 20 hours of flight and, and people are just kind of like not even thinking and, and reflective of what's going on. So where you are this week, there'll be situations where you will be Jesus. May your feet take you to a place. May your hands show mercy. May your tongue be honest and you, you'd be full of grace and truth. This has got to work in our everyday lives, in our marriages, with our families, with our kids, in our sporting clubs in our work in our neighborhood let's pray together let's close our eyes and reflect for a few moments before we sing a song what is the lord saying to you apply this personally 
to your life. As you're standing here today, is there a situation that straight away comes to mind over the past couple of weeks where you think, you know what? I haven't been very wise in this situation. Or I missed an opportunity to be Jesus in that particular context. He's saying to us today, let your eyes be, have humble eyes, have an honest tongue, have helping hands, helpful hands, make sure your heart is holy, let the Spirit of God soften it. Always be a grace giver as well as a truth teller and make peace wherever you are. Be part of the answer and not part of the problem. If he's speaking to you, that maybe there's a situation where it's not irretrievable, but he's saying it's time to take action, then do that today. In your heart, just say, Lord, I will take action. Or maybe there's been a situation and now it's, it's like, you know what? I was a bit foolish in that situation. Lord, help me not to be foolish. I'm not going to follow Lady Folly. I'm going to follow Lady Wisdom, as Solomon would say. Father, touch every person here today. Help us to apply your word and to be wise help us to learn learn the lessons but lord help us with the holy spirit's help to be able to apply truth into our circumstances into our daily life lord keep circumcising our hearts to reflect jesus and to be able to express him who loves us and who died for us and gave us new life as new creations in him. Bless every person here, their families, their situations. May good come out of them taking your word and applying it to their lives. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just lift our, our voices and just give thanks to the Lord.